All right. So actually, I think it's, it's great that I got to go after Mateos because he talked a lot about stuff that I'm going to kind of touch on with Svelkid. Uh He didn't mention Svelkid specifically, but, um, but I think it's, it's relevant. And uh, well, we already discussed who am I, but I do have a couple things I want to share that, first of all, I do work for LaunchDarkly. How many of you actually know what LaunchDarkly is? Oh my goodness, wow, okay. That's, I'm impressed, that's a lot of the room. Well, great, then for those of you who don't know what LaunchDarkly is, um, LaunchDarkly is basically like feature flags as a service, but imagine it like much more powerful than your kind of homegrown feature flags. So check us out. Um, and the th only other thing I want to share is next week I'm running a virtual conference called Code Word, which is like if you deal with, you know, if you're working with any kind of, on the web especially, you're probably dealing with content. So it talks all about how to deal with content in your code, um, accessibility issues, uh, how do you display it, and uh, different things like different CMSs and all that other stuff. It's totally free. It's all online. We got Chris Coyer, Cassidy Williams bunch of other great speakers, so please come join us at that. This is the QR code if you want to um, go ahead and scan it to sign up. Again, totally free next Thursday afternoon, 11 to 5 Eastern. Um, I don't know why that says CT. It should be Eastern time, sorry. Okay, so before I talk directly about Svelkit, I want to talk a little bit about JavaScript. So I'm sure you've heard of uh, somebody named Adi Asmani. He's written about the cost of, or presented, written and presented about the cost of JavaScript basically every year uh, for a number of years. And JavaScript remains one of the most, if not the, the most expensive resource on your site, and it has been since this first time he started talking about this around 2018. And that's because it's not just about the weight of the JavaScript resources, which continues to grow, but it's also about the time it takes to process those resources. So, and that weight keeps growing uh, every year. According to the Web Almanac's latest report, it grew another 8% for mobile in the past year. Um, and that's actually a smaller increase than in years past. So uh, that's good, I guess, but it's still expanding. Uh, and it can have a real detrimental effect on lower end devices that much of the world uses to access the web. So this is a distribution size of JavaScript, the JavaScript size um, and sites that they surveyed for the report. And to me, I mean, when I saw this, it was rather shocking to imagine that some sites are loading about a megabyte and a half of just JavaScript. Um, and I'm gonna suspect that those sites loading that megabyte and a half are not, they have a number of blocking scripts, meaning that the, while the user waits for this to download, that site is totally unusable. So, and the sadder part is much of that JavaScript weight is entirely unused. So the extra weight serves zero purpose. Um, as you can see, some sites are sending as much as 600K in unused JavaScript, which is, and why is there so much unused JavaScript is in many cases related to a growing list of third-party scripts that we all just kind of load inherently in our sites. But beyond unused JavaScript, I'm gonna, I, there's a category I totally made up, which I'm calling unnecessary JavaScript. Basically, unnecessary JavaScript is what I refer to as being where JavaScript being used where JavaScript is not needed. So it's not, it's not unused, it actually runs, but it's unneeded because it's related to something um, that, you know, at some point we started to use tools like, I mean, I love React, but started to use tools like React for just about everything, even, you know, tools like Gatsby made you use React for your blog, and it's like, do I really need React to present my blog content? Probably not. Um, so we started to kind of you overuse JavaScript in ways um, that made our sites heavier than they needed to be. So I kind of call that like unnecessary JavaScript. Um, so I don't know if any of you have read Alex Russell's post, The Market for Lemons, um, which dives deep into the history of how developers were convinced to be reliant on stacks that deliver, delivered increasingly large JavaScript bundles. Um, you know, and I know his, some of his rhetoric can be a little uh, hard to take in, um, but all the stuff he cites as evidence is backed up by data. Um, but the good news is, this has caused a lot of rethinking about, like, we're seeing a lot of, um, a ton of innovation around this issue. You heard it in Mateos's talk as well, um, not just from Svelte, but from, from tools like Astro, Quick, SolidJS. I'm really excited about all these tools and, and how they can get help us to reduce the amount of JavaScript on 
you know, that we're delivering to the client. Even some of the stuff that Mateos talked about, like React um, server components, is a way to help do that as well. So Svelte, um, how many of you have actually used Svelte already? Okay, a handful of you, not that many. Okay, good. Well, good, because this is an intro, so some of you that have used it might, might, might uh, I might repeat some stuff that you already know. But Svelte was created in, by Rich Harris. Uh, he initially released it in 2016. And it was, it was one of the first frameworks I thought that like, tried to really rethink how much JavaScript we send to the client um, and how we approach building single page applications. So the key difference in Svelte was this kind of the fact that it's compiled. Um, so during that comp compile process, it eliminates much of this unnecessary JavaScript to keep the bundle size small. Um, so this is a, from a comparison that was done back in February. And according to this, and this was done even before some, some recent updates, Svelte bundle size is less than 5% of the standard React bundle size. So uh, this was, as I said, done before Svelte 4 was released which in June, which actually reduced the package size and dependencies for Svelte down significantly and made uh, huge reductions to the compiled output of Svelte Kit apps. So while well, Svelte's been around since 2016, uh, Svelte Kit didn't hit 1.0 until like December of last year. So Svelte's been around for a while, but Svelte Kit hasn't actually been around as a full 1.0 um, framework for, for that long, actually. And it actually pre 1.0, it changed a lot. There was a point where I messed with it early on, and then if you waited a couple versions later, it actually you couldn't use that your old code at all. So it kept changing quite a bit, but now it's now this hit 1.0, as you'd expect, it's completely stabilized. Um, and then the way I think about SvelteKit versus Svelte is SvelteKit is like Next.js to React. SvelteKit is the full stack, like it gives you the server side and the client side, um, like Next.js does with React. Um, that's what SvelteKit is to Svelte. But SvelteKit, by the way, is a, an official Svelte project, so it's, it's actually maintained by the Svelte team. And Svelkit provides a number of different tools for, um, like it has a file-based router, um, it supports uh, TypeScript as well, obviously, because Svelte tends to, tends to lean you towards using TypeScript. Um, it supports uh, client-side rendering, server-side rendering, it has um, it's, it's multi-page app versus um, SPA, that's, so you, know, you can have client-side rendering and SPA, you can have SSR and multi-page app, um, you know, you can do static site generation, or sometimes we call that pre-rendering. You can do like all the acronyms, all of them. <laughs> so, um, so what do I what do I like about Svelkit? Um, so the thing I like about tools like Svelkit, I'm also very, by the way, very excited about Astro, and I've done a similar presentation about Astro. Um, is that it's just JavaScript. So, okay, as somebody who's used React quite a bit, but I'll be honest, I was never like, I'm not like a React fanboy or anything. Um, I always felt, because I always felt like I'm, I've been doing JavaScript a long time, and one of the struggles I had was that I knew how to do something in JavaScript, but I was often like, I don't know how to do it in React, um, because I didn't know the React way of solving a problem, and, and so like that, that frustrated me. But the thing about like tools like SvelteKit, Astro, I feel like the same way, is that I know JavaScript and I know how to solve things in SvelteKit or Astro because that's just how it solves everything. It's just JavaScript. There's some little helpers in there and some tactical sugar type things, but like it's just JavaScript. But obviously, as we've talked about up to this point, it's less JavaScript. So we're not sending as much JavaScript to the client, which is better for our end users ultimately. So one of the things that particularly about SvelteKit I like, and we'll see as we dig into the sample app that I created here, is that I, I like, it's easier for me to wrap my head around because of the way it separates backend and front end code. So if you've ever used like Next.js, one, one of the difficult things often is that you'll get an error and you're like trying to figure out why that error is not showing up in say the server console and it's happening on the client or vice versa. And, and it's often hard to kind of wrap your head around the differences of where, where a particular piece of code is running at any given time. Um, SvelteKit allows me to kind of specify where, where things are running and it, it, it separates those things in a way that's easier for me at least to wrap my head around. Um, so 
and, it, and also, it's relatively easy. I found like it's pretty easy to get started. Um, and you don't have, while I love Astro as well, and I'm kind of torn between the two, like I found SvelteKit in some ways was easier to kind of get wrap my head around as well because it doesn't have the issue of islands. Right, so islands are very cool, but islands can add a bunch of complexity that you, you kind of have to think about when you're creating your application, which with Svelkit, I don't really have to think about that so much. So, um, and then if you want to think about like, okay, who's using Svelkit right now? Uh, they don't really actually advertise like on their site about usage. So I had to kind of dig through because I wanted to find examples of like who's actually using this in production. Um, so. Uh, Brave is, uh, you know, the browser. They're using it for their their site. Uh, Vercel uses it in some places. Obviously, Vercel a lot of Next.js, but they also use it in some places. Which Rich Harris now is employed by Vercel to work on this full time. So work on on Svelte and Svelkit full time. So like that's not surprising that they would be using it. New York Times uses it um, on some of their sites. Um, that's where Rich Harris was before. So that kind of makes sense as well. Schneider Electric Gitbook. So I would say, much like if you look through the examples of Astro, if you're if you're trying to make the case at your company, there's not a lot of big companies with production use cases that you can point to yet. Um, but that being said, I expect this to continue to expand, not just because Vercel now is backing it because they hire Rich to work on this uh, full time, but um, if you look at like this this chart here, this is from uh, the JavaScript uh, state of JavaScript survey. Svelte, Svelte, hit, um, Svelte continues to outpace other frameworks in um, in terms of like the interest in in using. So like people are really interested in learning Svelte and in in adopting it. Um, in fact, if you look at these this chart here, it compares to React and Vue uh, for the green streams, which is like a, the interested and using. Um, Svelte you leans much more into the interested, not yet, not yet using, but um, you can see like compared to the other frameworks, it's act, they're much, much lower. Um, I think it's, it's interesting that Angular is like, has a big red thing in the middle where I know it and I don't want to use it anymore. <laughs> so, um, and uh, work has already started on Svelte 5, which is actually going to be interesting because it's going to rewrite the, the whole compiler for Svelte. Um, and and the runtime, so that should be really interesting. It's, and I expect that to come out. I mean, it's, I think it's still a lot of work to be done, but that's already in progress. So before I jump into my demo app, I do want to kind of cover a little bit about the structure of a SvelteKit app. So because it's kind of unique, in my, at least in my view, of how it's structured. So. As you can see, you obviously have your configuration files, your Vite config and your Svelte config, which I'm not gonna dig too much into. I'll show you mine, but there's not a lot to, to show in that right now um, for like a, a basic application. Obviously, this is where you'd configure any kind of plugins and things like that you're gonna add in. But you, you see under the roots, there's all these things with the plus. The plus is actually part of that file name. So like plus layout.js, and plus layout.svelte. Svelte, the .svelte are, are basically the, the front end component like the HTML and stuff like that. It's a Svelte component. The .js is matching. So there's usually like two files that match each other. Like so that plus layout.svelte goes with that plus layout.js. Um, so if it's, lay, if it's just the .js, this is client side code. Um, if it's .server.js, this is like, I'm only gonna run it on the server. One quirky thing about SvelteKit is that by default in certain cases, it'll actually try and run it both on the client and on the server, which is why you have to kind of tell it, hey, just this can only run on the server because if you try and run this on the client, it's gonna blow up um, and, or vice versa, right? So you can actually tell it like, oh, this only run this particular code on the client, only run this particular code on the server which does add a little bit of complexity, but the way you can structure your Svelkit app, you can actually specify in the name of the file where, where you want that to run. Um, so in the case of like say, um, plus page in the, in, the, uh, in the root, in the kind of base of the roots uh, folder would be my index.html file. And that's, that goes with that plus page.server.js would actually run in parallel. That's the server-side code for my index.html page. 
Um, and then I can do like catch all paths, like that dot, dot, dot path um, that would pass that information down to like my page so I could then parse that path variable. And obviously I can specify any number of kind of dynamic paths. Like if you're ever used to any kind of framework like Next.js and stuff has a similar syntax for that. Um, so like the path on the lower one would be like I could pass that path or in the case of the demo app, you'll see I'm passing an ID for a particular record and things like that. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to show is also like, so, so in those, it, it, like if I had a plus page dot, um, dot, dot JS, or sorry, plus page dot svelte in that about, that would actually be about, you know, my um, URL slash about, right? So it's, that's where it's gonna render. So you kind of have to, you can't, in some frameworks like in Astro and stuff, you can put like an about dot, dot uh, HTML, or in this case, like about dot svelte under the root, and that would be slash about. In this case, you have to put it in the folder like that. It doesn't, it doesn't work the other way. Um, and then uh, the only other thing I wanted to s say there is you can nest these layouts. So like, um, I actually, you can have that plus layout there, but then you can have a plus layout in a folder underneath that would actually like kind of nest inside the layout that's above it. So you can build upon a layout as you, you know, as you nest them within your folder structure there. So that is the structure of the app. So that sets some context for like what the demo I'm gonna show you. Now I'm gonna do something here. I am actually gonna escape out of here and I'm gonna switch to mirroring so this works a little easier. All right. So this is my little application. I'm just gonna show you how it works. It's nothing spectacular, but, um, but I do, I actually have to go here. And I've got, uh, the, in the back end here, this is all built with AppWrite. I'm actually using AppWrite like for, for the data storage as well as AppWrite for the authentication and stuff like that. So this is just a magic link authentication. I am gonna have to actually flip over to my email here, sorry, and get, and get my email. No, this is not the right email, different email. All right, no. No, not my LinkedIn stuff. You guys get to read all my email while I wait. Please, don't take, there we go. I need to get this URL. I'm gonna head back over. Sorry, because it's all running on localhost. I wanna open it there. There we go. Okay, so now I'm signed in using my magic link. Um, what this is, is like, so I, I, one of the things I'm really bad at is actually tracking all the sessions I submit. I haven't filled, fill this thing in fully, but like I submit to a bunch of sessions and, and I have, I wanna save like the stuff so I can resubmit to other places and things like that. So I built this little app that like has sessions that I've created. Um, when I created them, I can create a new session in here, um, just give it a title and an abstract. Um, and when I go into it, I can obviously see details about it and I can say where it was submitted and things like that. So I can, if I can if submitted it to a new place, I can add a new one and and you know the date, the conference date, the date I submitted it, the URL for the conference, and things like that. So, uh, pretty pretty simple app, but works. So I can click here and accept. I didn't get accepted to Magnolia JS, but I'll pretend like I did. Let's pretend. See, I'm now accepted to Magnolia JS. Look at that. All right. See you all there. Um, all right. So that's that's the gist of the app. Um, nothing too complex, but I think it kind of shows you some of the the core of how Svelkit works. So this is my. Um, my, uh, my application code, you can see the structure. Can you all see that well? I'm actually gonna enlarge it, sorry. Looks like it's pretty small up there. So you can see the structure that I talked about earlier. We have uh, at the root, we have um, a bunch of configuration files, like my, uh, in this case, like PostCSS configuration file. Um, I've got a Tailwind configuration because I am using Tailwind for this as well because I can't design anything to save my life. Um, and then this is the basic configuration file. I uh, honestly, I didn't do anything to this. This is kind of the, the default configuration that's generated for you when you create a new Svelkit app. And I haven't added anything to it because it wasn't necessary for this particular application. Um, and then you can see here, uh, if, you go, if we go into the, the roots, these are, again, um, in this case, we have a layout. This, my layout is pretty, pretty basic. It's just kind of a, a shell for it, but I've got um, a bunch of code that runs. Uh, this is a, this code here, if it's in the script tag here, 
it'll either run it'll run on the client and the server, or I can specify like which one I want it to run. But then this layout.server.js, this is telling this code will run when the index page loads, but it will only run on the server, and that's because I'm doing some stuff that I need to happen on the server. It's not going to work on the client, so so I'm doing this on the server here, um, basically checking to see if they're authenticated, and if they're not authenticated, passing them off to a different URL. You can see uh, I'm using some just standard, like, wh again, what I like about this and Astro is it just uses standard browser APIs to do things like getting cookies or doing, um, you know, anything like that, like getting path information, things like that. I don't have to learn, like, a different way of doing things. It's just browser APIs. Um, but they do provide things like this redirect. For instance, I can, I can uh, throw a redirect to, like, send them server-side redirect to, to a different page here. Um, so that's basics of that page. So that layout will wrap, will run and wrap on every single page. So that's why I put, for instance, this redirect code will actually run on, this layout runs on every single page because, it, you know, it, that's kind of the default layout file in the root of my folder, my root folder um, that will run on all the pages. Now, I don't have any, any nested layouts. All these kind of use just the default layout. Um, but if I did have, say, like a different layout, file under like say add session, why is this not clicking? There we go. It would actually nest that within that layout file as well. So um, then you, you have your Svelte component, which is like this one is just a basic um, simple little uh, like list that lists out all the sessions they've already created. Um, you know, you can also uh, put, uh, where's that CFP card? So like this is my little component. I mean, again, simple, ba this is, there's nothing here like that is super like, I think if you understand some basic JavaScript and you understand some, you know, HTML, there's nothing in here that's like, oh, that, that's the Svelte code way of doing things. Um, all I'm doing is like basically putting parameters in, in here like you would used to. They use single brackets instead of double like some of the other ones, but other than that, I'm just, um, it's just JavaScript code. These though, like this, is stuff that's the kind of small things that are helpers that are provided by Svelte. So like in this case, I'm looping over each um, item in the data.sessions um, property that's passed into this template and then repeating that CFP card. So this is, this is the kind of minimal amount of like Svelte specific code you'll find in, in a lot of this kind of thing. So uh, all I'm doing is just, I'm passing in this data this, when I put this export let data, it's actually going to look for that data variable. In this case, I'm actually passing it in server side um, in the in the page.server.js here. Uh, click. Sorry, my computer's running a little slow here. So I'm passing in I'm passing in some data in here, and that's actually you can see like the sessions.documents is the the documents that's getting from the AppRite server. Um, the AppRite database, and it's passing that to my page, and I'm passing it like I'm saying, okay, get the data and loop over those sessions, and then and then output them uh, with that session component. Um, and then some of the other things I show you is uh, okay, the authentication page is pretty. This one's pretty basic. Like this is all happening client side because of the way that. Um, AppRite does magic links. It all has, has to happen on client side. Um, so a lot of this is really just getting uh, getting cookies and things like that, getting and sending cookies and doing redirects on the client. Um, and so this is one thing that it, Svelte Kit provides. Remember I said like some things you want to make sure they run on the browser and some things you want to make sure they run on the client. So Svelte Kit has these little helpers like this, this browser um, component like variable here, and that tells you if you're running in the browser. So in this case, I needed to make sure that we're running in the browser before I try to set this cookie. So I wrapped it in this if browser. So this, this code inside of here will only run if I'm on the browser. If it's running on the server, it won't run. Again, that in this case, it kind of mixes the two in this script tag. So you often need to like kind of check those things as well. It, all, it provides like different things, like I got this much like that redirect was going for server-side redirect, this go-to is a client-side redirect um, because, and I had to do that because uh, 
because of the way, again, magic links work with AppWrite, it's all client-side code, so I'm redirecting using the go-to, which is, again, a client-side redirect. Um, and then they've got like, you know, the page, where is that page variable here? Um, oh, yeah. So the page, the, the page just is allowing me to access like the search params because I'm looking in this case for that token that you pass when you pass the magic link. I'm going to check that token. So these are kind of little helpers that, that Svelkid provides that allow you to kind of access things like URL, URL variables or check if you're in the client or in the server or to do redirects and things like that. So all of that's just like little helpers. But other than that, this is all just kind of standard JavaScript. Um, Okay, so all of this, I, I'm not gonna go through every page in this application, but it's pretty, I think it's pretty basic, you know, way to like kind of see all the, the way an application works. A lot of this, this particular page is server-side rendered, but you can kind of get the idea of, of, of both. And it does a little bit of client-side rendering and a lot of server-side rendering. I actually like using server-side rendering in, in Svelkit quite a bit. Okay, I'm gonna go back, extend my desktop. Let's see, we get, Oh, okay. We're gonna just kind of finish up because I only have a few minutes left. If I could actually find my mouse. Oh, is it there? I see it, no. Where are you, mouse? Jesus. Oh. Is my mouse, is, do you all see my mouse up there? Is it on my, no, oh, here it is, it's here. There it is, yes. This is like, I use this, this software for like, doing slides that I can write it in Markdown, and it's usually great, but like it does not let me specify which screen this, the, my speaker notes show up on, and so I have to do crazy things like that. So we did the demo. Okay, so because I work for LaunchDarkly, just quick thing, um, I'm not trying to pitch you on LaunchDarkly, but of course you can use LaunchDarkly in Svelkit. Um, the tricky part, again, because uh, some of this is server side and some of it's client side. You can use like the, you can use our, our server side Node.js library to wrap stuff on the server side um, in flags, and you can actually then use our client side library to do the same. So you have to kind of same thing with Next.js right now. We're trying, I'm trying to get them to like do like a full Next.js tool set that would allow you not to have to do this, but you have to get, load a client-side SDK and a server-side SDK, depending on where you want to use the flags. If you're using them both, you have to load both. But you can use flags, obviously, in Svelkit. It's pretty easy. And then the easiest way to get started is there's a learn.svelte.dev, which will go through Svelte, like the general Svelte, like the client-side Svelte, because you could use Svelte without Svelkit, obviously. Um, so it will go through the client-side Svelte, but then it will also dig into things like the, the roots and all that stuff on Svelkit. So if you get through the client-side stuff, it'll dig into the server-side stuff and the full-stack you know, Svelkit applications. That's kind of the easiest way to go through and, and learn. But you can also use my code that I, I showed you there. I didn't get to go through it all, but you can actually get the slide deck with all my speaker notes as well and, and all the code for that the, the, in that GitHub repo has the code for that application if you wanted to try and run it. You'll need your own instance of AppWrite, but that's pretty easy to set up. Um, and I give you instructions in the README about how you can set that up and run it. Or if you just want to dig through and look through the code and understand like how a Svelkit app works, hopefully that's a, a good example for you. Um, and I know, you know, I'm, I got a minute left, so, you know, if you, if you want to have any questions, the easiest way, I'm going to be here the rest of the day, you can find me, you can grab me, and we can talk about Svelkid, or if you have a question about Astro, I'd love to talk about that too, or you can find me on Mastodon, mostly Blue Sky, rarely, um, and Twitter never. So, um, yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thanks for listening.